G'day there guys, Marky here, and welcome back to another bloody good episode. Just a reminder that these episodes are also available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Overcast, links to the main ones in the description box below. Now with that said, I want you to sit back, relax, chuck a prawn of the barbie, and get ready for it. Let's go. Am I the asshole for punishing my son harshly for a prank on a vulnerable person? I, female 48, have a son Jack, male 19, and a daughter Alyssa, female 18, and am married to Tom, male 50. Tom is Alyssa's father, but Jack's father is my ex-husband Dan, male 48. Dan and I had a pretty ugly custody fight, and he lives in New York while we live in Texas. Over the years, Dan has unsuccessfully tried to get Jack to move in with him. It wasn't easy to fight him off since he's a very successful lawyer. Jack is a pretty popular kid in school. His friends on the wrestling team came up with a prank for him to ask a heavily autistic girl who had a crush on him to the prom as a joke and for him to show up wearing a gorilla suit. Jack originally said no, but the wrestling team actually raised a fund which got to be somewhat north of 800 bucks for him to do it and they paid for the gorilla suit. Jack agreed. If it matters, this is very out of character for him. After the prom, I was looking around on Instagram and saw pictures of him in the gorilla suit, and I was surprised that he didn't take his girlfriend, Jess. After reading the comments, I learned what happened. To say I was furious doesn't even do it justice. I woke Jack up as soon as I saw it and screamed at him until my lungs gave out. Then when Tom heard what was going on, he joined in too. Tom and Jack have never gotten along. I can't prove it, but I suspect Jack's father, Dan, has a hand in that. Jack told Tom to F off, I'm talking to my mother. So we took away all of Jack's electronics, his phone, and we had paid for a car for his graduation present. Because of his prank and disrespect to Tom, we gave it instead to Alyssa. We also forced him to give us the 800 bucks back and we gave it to his date and made him write a letter of apology. He was also grounded for a month and we canceled his 18th birthday party. When Jack's birthday came, there was a knock at the door. It was Dan and he had suitcases. Tom said, what is this? The custody agreement says that you don't get him on this birthday. Dan just looked past Tom and said, hey kid, I'm here for the jailbreak. He then pointed at a Mustang and said, hope you like Fords. You can practice driving a new car on a road trip back to New York. Let's take a detour to New Orleans. The two of them were laughing, high-fiving and backslapping, and they just ignored us as we tried to intervene. The only time Dan acknowledged me was to look me in the eye and say cold as ice, checkmate. And for Jack to yell as they were driving off, F off Tom. Since then, Jack has gone totally no contact with me. He talks a little bit to Alyssa, and from the little he does tell her, he's doing well, and Dan is giving him the royal treatment, bringing him to steakhouses, Yankees games, and just giving him outright cash. It has been almost a year, and I'm going crazy thinking I've lost my son. So, am I the asshole? Edit, I see there is a little confusion here about whether Alyssa is my daughter or stepdaughter. She is my stepdaughter. We really have a mother-daughter relationship to the point where it doesn't even occur to me to call her my step. At the risk of understatement, Jack never warmed to Tom the same way. OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the asshole. The action I took, which should be judged, was punishing my son for grounding him for a month, canceling his 18th birthday party, giving away the $800, and giving the car we were buying him to his sister. I wonder if I was too harsh since he hasn't talked to me in almost a year. Now in the comments, you're the asshole because clearly you don't know about punishments. I mean, giving what was supposed to be his to another kid? Yeah, that's the biggest no-no. There are many ways you could have went about this, but you didn't, and now you did lose your son. Pranking someone who was autistic is absolutely horrible and disgusting, but I don't think you went about your punishment in the right way. It seems like he doesn't get what he did, and you didn't even try to tell him. You just took away his car and money, which his dad has now bought for him. I don't know, no advice here, but lesson learned. You're the asshole. A kid who grows up to be a person who takes an autistic girl to prom while dressed in a gorilla suit does not happen overnight. You yourself have said that you were not equitable in terms of child custody, and it turns out that you were just using the child support to pay the mortgage. 
On top of that, the child support was supporting Tom who was on disability and it makes sense for a kid who does not like his stepfather trying to be his father to be upset that the money that is supposed to be for the child's support was used to support someone who then decided to turn around and be the strict parent. You do realize that the moment you started supporting Tom with Jack's money, because that is what child support is, that Jack's disrespect for his stepfather was going to deepen. Especially if Tom can go turn off Jack's Xbox and then Tom can heat up his own damn plate. And then to make it difficult for Dan to see Jack and also have him support your entire household? Yeah. I'm more inclined to believe that you're upset initially at losing your piggy bank and now you're regretting anything because now there are questions on how you spent the money. The bit of mum guilt regarding Easter is a nice touch to add for those inclined to see the best in a parent who tried to punish her child. However, your main focus, as stated either outright or not in numerous comments you have posted, was to get ahead of Dan. If you had a more equitable custody issue and weren't so money hungry, I honestly don't think Dan would have been as bad. As it is, you chose all of this. You chose to keep Dan away from his son. You chose to make Jack's child support a big part of your household budget to where you are now panicking about a mortgage payment. You chose to let Tom be strict with Jack. You chose money and Tom over Jack, and I'm guessing that he already saw that and that's why he went off with his father so willingly and stayed no contact with you. And someone replies to that, I didn't notice this on my first pass, but I think you're right. This was always about the money. It will be interesting to see how long Tom sticks around without Dan's wallet. I had to scroll through OP's comments and honestly, I think that's good that Jack left because now he's no longer footing the bill for Tom or his mom. A minor child's child support should not be used to where it makes up for the largest or a large chunk of the household budget to where the budget is screwed if it is suddenly gone. When I found that out, it was a hard you're the asshole for the OP for me because now the child support isn't for the child, it's for the adult who chose a mortgage that they could not afford on one income. Not knocking those that do choose to buy a house where it takes two incomes, but the income to support it should never be a child's child support. By doing that, OP opened herself up to audits from the ex because the money was not used as intended, and for that I have zero empathy because she brought that on herself. And now onto the update. So I was denied an official update, but a few of you cared enough about all of this to ask me for updates periodically, so here it is. On the advice of some of the posters, I reached out to Dan to see if he would be willing to consider brokering peace between me and Jack. About a week later, I got a response telling me to meet him and Jack at a cafe in Manhattan. He arranged a 6am flight and put me in a dodgy hotel in probably the most dangerous neighborhood in New York City. I arrived and saw Dan, Jack, Jack's girlfriend Jess, and his friend from a past firm, Jonathan. I noticed that Jess had an engagement ring on her finger. Jonathan said Jack has a claim against me for stealing the $840, and until that is resolved, I am not to contact him, but to only contact Jonathan. I told Jonathan that that's the money his friend paid him for the prank, and that I gave it to the girl. Jonathan said he was aware of the circumstances, but nonetheless it wasn't my money, and under the law, it was a theft, and Jack has a legal claim against me. I said I don't care if it was against the law. Jack had no right to that money, and they can sue me if they wanted. Jack said, you locked me up in my room like a prisoner for a month, took the car that you bought for me with dad's child support money, took the money, and berated me for hours on end. Unless you're going to give me the car, this is the only thing you can undo. You said you wished we could have handled it better, so here is your chance. Or was that just bullcrap lip service? I told him that I was sorry, but I can't do it. Jonathan then gave me a cease and desist letter, telling me to not contact Jack and to address all communication to Jonathan. Then Jack and Jess left, and I asked Dan if he could talk for a minute. I asked him if he brought me there to humiliate me, and he said actually no he didn't. He brought me so I could humiliate myself. 
He had actually worked very hard to get Jack to the point where he'd be open to talking to me again if I were willing to back down just a little. But since he knew that if I had to choose between my indignation and my own son, that I'd choose my indignation every time, just like I did in our marriage. I asked him why he would put us through all that. He said that it was because a part of him wondered if I'd ever learned to pick love over anger. He bet his future that I wouldn't when he divorced me. So he had to see for himself how it actually turned out after all these years later. I asked him if Jack was just a pawn in his game, and he said no. If I actually would have picked Jack, he'd be with me now, and there would have been nothing anyone could have done to stop it. But instead, my indignation over a stranger was more important to me than learning to move on with my own son. I asked him what about the girl? He then said, I hope she'll be a wonderful daughter to you since you lost a son for her. I told her that I don't know the girl. So then he said, sounds like a bad trade, and left. Also, I'm apparently not invited to Jack's wedding. And now in the comments, the inciting incident here just makes me sad, man. When I went to prom, a girl in our group got asked out by an autistic guy in our class, and not having anyone else she wanted to go with or to make him feel left out, she said yes. It was clear from the jump that they were going as friends, but he was still psyched and we were all happy to see it. By the time we actually got to the dance, he was so anxious about the whole thing that he locked himself in a stall in tears. When I went to cheer him up, every single other guy that saw what was going on came to have his back too. When he was confident enough to head back out, we went with him, and not a single one of the girls said so much as a negative word about it. Not because he was special, but because he was a nice dude and none of us wanted to leave a man down. Now that I'm older, I'm sure nothing any of us did made some crucial, foundational, positive memory for him, but I'm just glad that we did what we could to help prevent it from being a bad one. The idea of taking $800 in exchange for that guy's dignity like this kid did to the girl in his class is so fundamentally disgusting that all of my thoughts about it are TOS violations. What's the am I the asshole term for everyone involved as an asshole? That, that so much. Son is an asshole for this horrible prank. Stepdad is an asshole for beefing with a teenager. Just from reading this story, you can tell there is a lot that we aren't hearing. Mum is an asshole for letting stepdad treat her son like crap. I don't know why they don't like each other. Oh yeah, he favors corporal punishment and jumps at the chance to yell at my son, but he's an old man with a bad back, so it doesn't count. It must be my ex's fault. The punishment sounds like the final straw in a screwed up relationship, even if the kid absolutely deserved to have his feet held to the fire. Dad slash ex is an asshole for enabling his son's shitty behavior just to get back at his ex. Like yeah, jailbreak your son from that toxic household, but for Christ's sakes, don't let him off the hook for humiliating an autistic kid so badly. That's some carry crap right there. The son is lucky telekinesis doesn't exist IRL. Even putting the mum's bias against her ex aside, I definitely get the vibe that the dad is willing to use his son to hurt the mum, which is super screwed up. No wonder son is shitty enough to humiliate an autistic kid. Has this guy ever had a non-toxic parental figure? In conclusion, I hope the autistic girl lives a long and happy life full of kindness and empathy. I hope Jack gets away from all these shitty adults and grows a sense of empathy, shame, and conscience, and I hope Alyssa manages to escape the toxic dynamics that have already ensnared her brother. Everyone else can go to hell. Thank you and good night. Dad, I played a horrible prank on a vulnerable person and got a somewhat harsh punishment. Oh, don't worry, son. I'm gonna show up with your own fancy car and shower you with cash. Cool, dad. I feel so cool about my piece of crap actions now. For me, the worst part is how petty the son is being over the $800. If he had asked for his car back, I would understand, but no. He doesn't need the old car now that dad has got him a fancy car. So he decides to dig in and ask for the money that he was paid to be terrible to a girl who didn't deserve it. If the OP should read this, I'm sorry that you're going through this, and especially that your son is being a complete ass. I would not give him the money because he's essentially saying that he values your relationship at $800. That is awful. Our next post is titled, I, 35 male, think my sister-in-law, 40 female, is messing with me, but I'm not too sure. Okay, I know this will sound weird, but stay with me here. 
A few years ago, I got diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder, depressive type. It kind of came later in life, so when the symptoms hit, I was working full time and had a decent job. After it started getting worse, I ended up losing my job and now I'm in the process of going for disability. It's not where I wanted to go in life, but I'm trying my best. It's been hard. Trying to find the right medication is a cow, but I've found ones that are working wonders and my hallucinations have been down by a lot. Things were starting to look up. So my wife, Kathy, 33 female, has been really supportive and is basically supporting me financially. It's one of the hardest things about going through this, to be honest, having to live like a deadbeat husband and having my wife work extra hard for the both of us. Her family has been less than thrilled and I can't really blame them. I'm still cordial with them, but it's tense. A few months ago, Kathy's sister, Sue, left her husband and came to live with us along with her baby. I can't say I'm happy with new people in the house, but I understood and tried to be accommodating with her, and for a while, things were good between Sue and I. She's always been a little nervous with me ever since my diagnosis, as when it first came out, she immediately sent a text to my wife saying she didn't trust me around her kid for babysitting anymore, but she had seemed to lighten up and everything seemed good. It started last month where, every time I walked past Sue when we were alone, I'd hear her whisper stuff that I couldn't make out. I'd ask her if she said anything, and she'd always said no, and so I assumed that she was mishearing stuff, or maybe it was my audio hallucinations. But it started to happen more often, like every damn time I was near her. Sometimes we'd be watching a show, and I'd hear whispering coming from her, but I never could get a good look at her mouth to see if it was her or not. She'd either be turned away from me or behind and in front of me. The whispers started getting louder and I could actually make out what they were saying. Stuff like, kill them all, or I want that cow. Which really started to worry me. My hallucinations always have been kind of rough, but they've always seemed focused on me. Stuff like, I hate you, or you're a failure. Or maybe even, the boy who lived came to die. Never the other stuff, so I was worried that they were going to get worse on me. Then I started hearing voices from other rooms. It sounded like someone was talking from other rooms, and anytime I'd ask Sue if she'd heard anything, she'd claim not to. The weird thing is, my audio hallucinations are different from what I was hearing. My hallucinations have always sounded female, where the voices from the other room have been male. My voices also sound like they are whispering right next to my ear, while these ones sounded like they were taking place somewhere else. The weirdest part was, was that what the voices said sounded a lot like a meme from 4chan. They like to message people from the schizophrenia subreddit and tell them that they are hiding in their walls, and that's exactly what I was hearing in the other room. I started searching for the source of the voices around the house, but Sue got scared and started telling my wife I was going crazy again. I know it looked bad, but my hallucinations sound and say different things, so I was making sure that it wasn't something else. Today, things got worse. My medication ended up being missing, like I kept it in the kitchen at night, but the bottle was gone this morning. When I asked Sue if she saw my medication, she got really scared and hid in her room with the baby. Her mom and dad came over, and they weren't necessarily hostile with me, but they blocked my way and took Sue to their house for the day. They called up my wife and told them that I had been harassing her and going crazy at Sue, and they feared for Sue and her baby with the schizo around. I really think Sue is messing with me. I've had trouble taking my medications in the past when my symptoms were at the worst, but I really liked this medication that I was on, and I'm nervous about waiting a few days for more of it. The problem is, I really could be hallucinating everything. Yeah, it's different from my other hallucinations that I had in the past, but hallucinations can change with time, and if I was becoming delusional again, not like I'd really know it either. I really don't want to be scaring Sue, but it just doesn't seem right. None of this stuff happens when my wife gets back home from work, only when it's just me and Sue at home. I didn't think that she'd be capable of doing stuff like this, but everything about this just feels wrong. I'm not sure how my wife is feeling about this, I haven't had a chance to talk to her in depth about it, and what little we do get to talk about, I couldn't really tell how she was feeling about everything. She's been my biggest cheerleader and supporter throughout all of this, but her family is saying my symptoms are targeting her sister and nephew now, so I'm not too sure what's going through her mind. I just don't know what to do. 
Ever since this started happening, my symptoms have made a comeback, so I've heard my usual hallucinations from the stress of everything. I don't want to be a monster, and I was thinking of maybe getting myself into the psych ward, but I just have this feeling that this is just Sue effing with me. My delusions and hallucinations have always been spirit related, not targeting anyone specifically. And if it is Sue that is doing this, why in the world would she be messing with me like this if she truly believed I was dangerous? What should I do? And now in the comments, call your psychiatrist, ask for emergency meds, and ask for an appointment as soon as possible. Use your phone to record any sounds that you hear. I'm really sorry, I know this is hard. I have a family member who has struggled with this for 40 years. Reach out to your doctor. This. Recording the whispers is the best way to know if it is your sister-in-law or not. No offense, but I don't think sister-in-law is good for your health either way. I would ask her to leave and live with her mom and dad. Yeah, whether it's her messing with you or not, the stress of the situation could be making your symptoms change or become worse. The added stress and changes in your routine are not good for your mental well-being, whatever the case may be. Sit down with your wife and lay all of this out. Don't accuse Sue of anything, but tell her you were genuinely concerned that this only happens when your wife isn't home. Tell her that you would feel better asking Sue to stay somewhere else for the time being. From there, keep an eye on what you're feeling. If after Sue is gone, things get better, then you know that something was up. If it doesn't get better, then you know that it wasn't her. Either way, have your wife suggest to Sue for her to stay away for a few days somewhere else. Make sure she doesn't say it's because of your mental health, because it sounds like Sue is already scared enough as it is. Another good idea would be to pull out your phone when you hear the voices. Record your phone and send the video to your wife or a friend. Ask them if they hear anything in the video that's out of ordinary. Another person can confirm or deny what you are hearing. For now, stay calm and avoid confronting Sue directly. It sounds like she's nervous already, and any more confrontation could cause her to call her parents again as an SOS painting you in a negative light. And OP replies, I plan to show her this post when she comes back, so hopefully we can come up with a solution. And now on to the update. First things first, I was able to get my medication in about two days, so I wasn't without my antipsychotics for too long, thankfully. When my wife got home, we had a talk about what has been happening. I talked to her about Sue when I was alone with her, and even let her read over my previous post. My wife is a rock star, and she took everything I said well. We acknowledged the fact that it could still be hallucinations, because we didn't have proof. But my wife had her suspicions of Sue, and told me that it's not outside the realm of something Sue would do. My wife told me that Sue had talked to her earlier in the week, and told her that I had not been taking my pills. My wife was confused by this because I tend to take my pills in front of my wife. I had a hard time with taking pills when I was first diagnosed, and still having delusions. She had assured Sue that I had been taking my pills, and thought that it was Sue just being extra paranoid. We went and searched for the pills one last time, but they were gone. We decided to not have Sue back over anymore. My wife didn't like the idea of her sister and nephew homeless, but she took to heart about what was said on the post and decided that it was for the best with everyone involved. I had been making good progress for a while, and she didn't want it to go away with Sue around. Of course, when she called up her family to tell them, they were pissed. Her parents screamed at her for choosing her husband over family, and later her sister called her up crying about how they were going to be homeless soon because the parents weren't going to let her stay there for too much longer. It hurt seeing my wife being caught up in this, and I'm not gonna lie, I almost relented about Sue staying with us, but my wife assured me that this was the right decision. So everything was quiet for a few days. I didn't have any of the new audio hallucinations with Sue around, let me tell you, it was a relief. I can't say that I was totally fine, as some of my old delusions were making a comeback, mostly spirits and hauntings. But I felt more relaxed at home, and was feeling good with her gone. I took the time to call up my doctor, and we had an emergency appointment, which made me feel better moving forward. So then, this happened about three days ago. My wife's family waited for my wife to go off to work, and came over to our place. The first thing I noticed was they actually brought a moving van. I don't know if their plan was to move me out, or move more of Sue's junk in, but they were there. 
moving van right in front of my yard. I texted my wife to let her know what was going on and then answered the door. I did not let them in. So basically, the dad comes up to me all aggressively and tells me that, as a family, they decided that I was too unstable to live at home anymore and to pack up my crap where having you committed. I told them straight up that crap wasn't happening and I wasn't going to go anywhere with them. The mum went on a rant about how I was so unstable and they weren't going to leave their nephew with someone so dangerous. I told them that Sue wasn't staying here so there is nothing to worry about. The mum tried to switch it up and sweet talk me then, saying that with my mental health on the decline, they were just so worried about me and were going to take me to the hospital for my own good and even said afterwards that I could live with my family until the nephew gets a little older. Not even after I get better, until the nephew gets older. I told them again, this is my house. I was not going anywhere. Sue was never staying over again and they needed to leave my house before I called the police. They laughed, which just pissed me the hell off. And yes, honestly, I should have called the cops, but between having schizoaffective disorder and me being a black man in an argument against an old white couple, I didn't like those odds of me ending up being the one getting arrested. I did text my wife that her family was trying to have me go to inpatient care, which made her leave work right away. So to shorten this up, we had a screaming match and it basically boiled down to this. If I didn't agree to move out for the safety of Sue and her kid, they would call up my landlord and let them know about my serious condition and what type of dangerous person was living at the house. They also implied that they were ready to have me involuntarily committed with all the other crazies if I fought them on this anymore and it was better to go with them now so that I would be taken into one of the good places. Backstory here. When I got diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder, my brother let me move into the house that I currently stay at today. We pay rent, but rent at a good rate because he wanted to make sure that I had a good place to stay. We've told her parents this before, multiple times even, but I guess they forgot this one little detail. So I told them straight up, my brother is my landlord. If I go, Sue still wouldn't live here, ever. If I go to inpatient, she isn't going to live here. This situation will never end with her living at this house. That shut them up, dead silent. They looked at me like I had just killed their dog. They tried to say a few more things, but about at that point, it kind of just fizzled out anticlimactically. Sue and her parents left afterwards. My wife came home not too long after her family left and she was pissed. Like, my wife is a five foot four tiny woman, but boy, was she mad as hell about what happened, especially going behind her back to do this. Cue more calls, more fighting with her family. She stood by me. She told them to stay the hell away from me, and I greatly appreciate that. I just know that it's killing her on the inside about not being able to see her nephew anymore. Before this happened, her family was supportive of her and very close. So it just blows my mind that the situation turned into this. She's going no contact with them for now. So that's where I'm at right now. Not doing the best mental wise to be honest. Might end up in patient care anyway the way that things are going. I keep getting paranoid that they are going to take me away somehow, but I'm still trying to remain calm with everything. Like I said, none of those new hallucinations when Sue was around, but with the stress of everything, I feel like I'm constantly surrounded and I'm going to be taken away at any moment. I've talked to my doctor again and we have a plan in place, but I really don't want to end up an inpatient if I can avoid it. It makes it worse knowing that my wife will be left alone without support, which makes me the most pissed off about this entire situation. Thanks for all the advice Reddit, it really helped me out in the end. And now in the comments, it's almost funny how they're crying to your wife about not letting her sister stay, but they won't even let her stay with them. Also funny to insinuate you aren't family to your wife. If they come again, don't answer the door, especially if your wife isn't there. I can easily imagine them making up lies about you, so protect yourself by avoiding them. I'm sorry that you had to deal with such terrible people, but I am so glad your wife is standing by you. Best of luck in the future. Just focus on getting better and loving your wife. 
The really sad thing is that OP lives in the US, where his in-laws could sick the police on him by claiming that he is mentally unstable, which will result in a mandatory stay in a mental ward. And given that he's a black man, that whole process can get him into very serious trouble, especially if they claim that he is violent. No wonder OP's paranoia is ramping up. Goodness, they sound like a lot of work. Must have felt so disappointing to be treated that way. It does sound very much like Sue was manipulating the situation. You sound like you're in a good place. You have an amazing wife, kind brother, and good doctor. Time to take some care of yourself and put the family drama behind you. I hope your mental health catches up with the great things that you have in life, even if it takes a while. Be gentle with yourself. I guarantee you that this whole confrontation was driven by racism, racism and ableism in a terrible union, an unholy matrimony with naked opportunism as the best man and narcissism as the maid of honor. I wanna know why the parents can't look after their daughter and grandson. Maybe they just sent the sister in to sabotage the relationship because I was also wondering why they couldn't do it themselves. Even if I was in a one room studio, I'd let my kid and grandson move in instead of be homeless. And now onto update two. Hey guys, sorry to those who I didn't get a chance to reply to on DMs. I figured I'd post an update on my profile for those who cared. Thank you for all the kind words and messages I received. It meant a lot to me. So for starters, my mental health has been okay. I'm still trying to find the right antipsychotic for me. It has been trial and error lately. I can have one that works pretty well, but end up raising my liver levels or sugar levels. All in all though, not too bad. Voices are still down to a murmur at best. Delusional states can be tough, but I still have my wife and other family for support. As for my wife's family, it's a mixed bag. My wife didn't talk to her parents for a while, but eventually she started talking to her parents again. I don't blame her, they're old and age is starting to get to them. She gave me the option to keep no contact, but I wasn't going to do that to my wife. Don't get me wrong, contact is low and still not back to what it was, but they aren't bothering me. From what my wife tells me, and what she can piece together from her parents, her sister Sue had been kind of pumping up her parents against me for a lot longer than I thought. From what they were hearing from Sue, they thought that I was a lot worse than they thought that I was. She had told the parents that I had really gone off the deep end, talking to myself and carrying a knife around the house, screaming at the top of my lungs, complaining that the government was after me. She even tried to say that I was aggressive towards her son, which none of this was true, obviously. It took a while for my wife's parents to trust that she was in fact okay and not in any danger from me, but they eventually started to believe her. I think it helped by the fact that Susan lost complete interest in me or in the situation once the idea of her living in the house was off the table. Don't get me wrong, I'm not forgiving them for the crap that they put me through. The fact is, if they had called the cops to get me that day, I could have been in serious trouble. I just can see why they suddenly went crazy on me if Sue was just feeding them stories upon stories of me going crazy and threatening her and her son. I don't like it, but I get it. My wife feels somewhat responsible for them, but the contact is still low, and they haven't seen each other physically since the altercation. She is sad about the situation. She never saw that side of her parents before, so it is hard for her. For her sake, as long as they stay the hell away from me, I do hope my wife and her parents can repair their relationship. Probably not what some wanted to hear about her still having contact, but my wife has given me a lot, and if they can have a relationship together again, I'm not going to stand in the way unless it's necessary. As for Sue, my wife is hardcore no contact with her, and that relationship is probably good and well dead. We only know from her parents that Sue is still living at their home, and that she might be getting back together with her ex. All I can say is, good luck to that dude. Some good news for us though is that I was finally approved for disability. I got really lucky, like really lucky, because sometimes you have to wait years waiting on getting approved and half the time they have to go to the court to prove your case. But it only took a year for us and now I can contribute some income so my wife doesn't have to work as hard anymore at work. I got back pay from my approval. So along with paying off a few of the heavier bills that we had, I also bought my wife a new camera. She has sold her old one when I had previously lost my job to pay for bills. 
so it was one of the first things that I bought her with the money. So all in all, things are going good. I love you guys, but I'm hoping this is the last update that I have to make on this situation. Thanks again for all of the support that you guys gave me. And now in the comments, Sue is such a horrible person. I hope for some sweet, sweet karma her way. She has to wake up as herself every day. I'd say that's karma enough. Oh, I would bet she thinks her crap doesn't stink and believes that she's the goat and would be living her best life if it wasn't for all these other people ruining it for her. This makes me feel sorry for her child. That poor kid is probably going to be posting on r slash raised by narcissists in so many years. With time moving on and Reddit becoming more popular, I wonder if we will ever see cross-generational Reddit drama. Like imagine Sue's kid finds this years later and makes the post, my mom always told me my uncle was a psycho, but I found a post that proves that my mom is the psycho. I have bipolar type two with severe anxiety. It's surprisingly well managed now with some lifestyle changes and CBT. And no, that doesn't mean cock and ball torture. Now, the hard part to explain is that severe anxiety can cause auditory hallucinations, but it's not like a voice telling you to do things. It's more like I'm hearing some intense music in my head or someone whispering just outside of the range I could understand it. It never makes sense and is really just a signal to me that I'm anxious now. The problem is when people have found out that I have hallucinations, they all immediately assume I'm psychotic. When the hospital literally deemed me non-psychotic and agreed with my family that I have a firm grip on reality. That's never been a problem for me. But dear God, the people that find out like to try and F with me. But the problem is they can't really recreate what my hallucinations sound like. Specifically, if I'm walking around, my hallucinations don't really change sound levels. So it's pretty damn easy to figure out, and my favorite go-to is to just subtly turn on my phone to record the person effing with me. Now, I know you don't mean cock and ball torture, but I can't read that as anything but that. Yeah, I'm talking about cognitive behavioral therapy, but I'm always up for a good time. Honestly, Sue can rot. She is a nasty piece of work, and I hope the wife sticks to no contact with her, because OP should never have to be exposed to that woman again. I honestly don't think the parents deserve any sympathy either, because their actions were also terrible. Trying to have OP removed from his own home? F that. They didn't give a damn about OP, only about their precious Sue. If they thought he was a danger, why the hell didn't the parents reach out to OP's wife? It's obvious they are full of excuses and backpedaling. I hope OP gets his meds sorted and just gets to live his life without this drama. Are we just going to ignore the very high possibility that Sue stole his meds? Pretty sure that's very illegal, and if they had found them in Sue's possession, would have cleared OP almost instantly. I hope the parents kick Sue out and never let her move back in. The nephew slash grandkids, sure, but Sue, never. The parents are idiots for letting that sociopath stay with them. I can't help but imagine her trying to get their house by kicking them into a care facility. Alright guys, that is enough CBT for today. Unfortunately, I'm all out of energy and my hands are tired. So as always, I do hope you enjoyed today's episode. Let me know what you thought of it down below and I will see you in the next one. Bye.